Okay, hi everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Laura DeCook and I'm a brand specialist on the YouTube operations team. I also want to send a big welcome to all of you on the live stream across the globe. Last fall, I had the pleasure of meeting our guest today, Mr. Don George, at an event sponsored by adventure travel company, Geographic Expeditions, for the organization Room to Read. For those of you who don't know what Room to Read is, it partners with local communities throughout the, the developing world to build libraries and develop literacy skills among primary school children. Now a little bit about our guest. National Geographic has called Don George a legendary travel writer and editor. Donna has been exploring new frontiers as an author, editor, and adventurer for almost four decades. He is also an acclaimed teacher, speaker, and tour leader, visiting more than 90 countries on six continents. Don has published hundreds of articles in dozens of magazines and newspapers around the world. He's been travel editor at the San Francisco Chronicle and global travel editor for Lonely Planet. He is the author of Lonely Planet's Guide to Travel Writing, the best-selling travel writing guide on the planet. Don currently is editor-at-large for National Geographic Traveler, special features editor for BBC Travel, and editor of Geographic Expedition's literary travel blog. He has received dozens of awards for his writing and editing, including 10 Lowell Thomas Awards from the Society of American Travel Writers. He consults globally on travel and social media and hosts a national series of onstage conversations with other prominent travel writers. Don's newest book, The Way of Wanderlust, the best travel writing of Don George, spans 24 countries on six continents, beginning with the 1977 tale of climbing Mount Kilimanjaro and ending with a 2015 story about exploring the jungles of Cambodia, my personal favorite story. It is a must read for any traveler lover and truly dives deep into the heart, mind, and soul of the global wanderer. Without further ado, I'm extremely honored to introduce Mr. Don George to all of you. Please give him a warm welcome. Oh. Thank you, Laura. Hello, everyone. Hi. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. I'm, I, was, I was hoping for a, maybe five people would show up, so I'm uh, kind of blown away right now to see a, a room full of you. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I want to begin by thanking Laura very deeply for, um, for inviting me to speak here and for coordinating this event and for spreading the word so wonderfully. Um, I want to thank Google for having me here and for putting on this great series of talks. What a, what a wonderful thing to do. Um, it's really a great honor and pleasure to be here today and to talk to you all. And I'm going to share my love of travel and hopefully hear about your love of travel and try to give you some good information and some inspiration too, I hope. Um, I want to thank Google. Uh, for everything that it does. I want to thank you for the great <coughs> products that you create. Uh, which I use every day, which everyone I know uses every day, and uh, pretty much everyone around the planet, I think, almost uses every day. And truly, you have done something to bring the world closer together, which is what I think travel does too. But in your own way, you're all bringing the world closer together, and I really appreciate that. And the world, I think, appreciates that, so thank you. On behalf of the world, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I've been extremely fortunate to spend my entire professional life doing the two things I love the most, traveling and, and writing. And as Laura mentioned, I recently published this book. It's a kind of culmination of uh, my career to date, The Way of Wanderlust, The Best Travel Writing of Don George. It brings together 35 of my best stories and essays from 40 years of world wandering and 38 years of publishing. So what I thought I would do today is talk briefly about my career as a travel writer and the book itself. I thought I'd read a couple of pieces from the book just to give you a, a little tiny sense of what the book is all about. And then I thought I would just open the floor to questions. So I, thought you've, I hope that you've come prepared with questions because I really love interacting with an audience. I love hearing why you're here or what questions you brought with you here. And I think that that often produces the best stories and the best interactions of all. So 
I'll tell you a little bit about my, my life as a travel writer, and we'll go from there. Um, I didn't start out to be a travel writer. I wanted to be a poet, which is a pretty practical goal. <laughs> Poets make a really good living, I understand. Um, my parents were thrilled when I announced that to them one day. Um, so in, in high school and in college, I, in college I studied uh, French, English, and American literature, and then I minored in creative writing. And uh, I would tell people I wanted to be a poet. I thought probably a more practical route was that I would be a, a, a professor, a Tweedy professor, the kind of professor that I had grown up with as role models, because when you're a student, those are your role models, your Tweedy professors. And so I thought that's what I would do with my life. Um, but I went to Princeton on the East Coast, and in the uh, spring term of my senior year, I just realized I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. I had no idea, and I really just wanted to postpone the decision as long as I could. So while my friends were going to applying to medical school and graduate school and business school and getting jobs at banks and having all kinds of practical career paths they were laying the pavement for, I didn't know what to do, and I ended up um, applying to the Princeton French Department for a summer work abroad uh, fellowship, which I got to live in Paris, and I worked as a translator in Paris for the summer. And then I applied to the Athens College in Athens, Greece for a one-year Athens College teaching fellowship, and I won that somehow. And uh, so my year after graduation, I went to, uh, to, went to Paris first, and then I went to Athens, and I spent a year abroad. And that's when everything changed. And I thought I would read a little bit, just a little bit from the introduction to my book about how things changed for me. I took my first serendipitous step on the path to becoming a travel writer the summer after I graduated from Princeton. While all my friends were preparing for graduate school, law school, business school, or medical school, or starting jobs with banks, I arranged to go to Europe for a year. First to spend the summer in Paris on a summer work abroad internship, and then to teach in Greece on an Athens College teaching fellowship. When I set off for Europe, I was thinking that year would be a brief interlude between undergraduate and graduate schools. But then, one sun-dappled June morning in Paris, the course of my life changed. As I had every morning for the previous two weeks, I took the rickety old filigreed elevator from my apartment right on the Rue de Rivoli looking onto the Jardin des Tuileries, and stepped into the street, into a sea of French. Everyone around me was speaking French, wearing French, looking French, acting French, shrugging their shoulders and twirling their scarves and drinking their café creme, calling out, bonjour, monsieur, dame, and paying for Le Monde or Le Nouvel Observateur with francs and stepping importantly around me and staring straight into my eyes and subtly smiling in a way that only the French do. Until that time, I had spent most of my life in classrooms. And I was planning, after that European detour, to spend most of the rest of my life in classrooms. Suddenly, it struck me. This was the classroom. Not the musty, shadowed, ivy-draped buildings in which I'd spent the previous four years. This world of wide boulevards and centuries-old buildings and six-table sawdust restaurants and glasses of vin ordinaire and fire eaters on street corners and poetry readings and cramped second-floor bookshops and mysterious women who smiled at me so that my heart leaped and I walked for hours restless under the plane trees by the Seine. This was the classroom. Hungry in a way I'd never been before, I gorged on Paris. I marveled at Moliere at the Comédie Française and the Ballet Béjar in the park. I idled among the secondhand shelves at Shakespeare and Company, eavesdropping on poets and posers. I immersed myself in Manet and Monet in the Musée d'Orsay, got lost in the ancient alleys of Montmartre and the Marais savored the open-air theater from a sidewalk seat on the Champs-Élysées, and conjured Hemingway on Rue Descartes and in Les Deux Magots Café. At the end of that summer, I rode the Orient Express to Greece and settled on the campus of Athens College. 
As it turned out, my fellowship duties were to teach five hours of literature and writing classes a week. I also had to write occasional speeches for the college president and write and edit articles for the school's quarterly alumni magazine. This left me uncharted expanses of free time, which I exuberantly filled reading Plato by the Parthenon, sipping ouzo on bazooki bright nights in the Plaka, communing with muses among the red poppies and white columns of Corinth, and exploring the beaches of Rhodes and the ruins of Crete. Winter and spring vacations afforded the time to venture even farther, and I wandered footloose through Italy, Turkey, and Egypt, intoxicated with the newness and possibility of this unfurling world. My wanderlust bloomed. Every moment seemed unbearably precious, every outing an exhilarating lesson in a new culture, place, and people, full of thrilling sights and smells, tastes and textures, creations and traditions, encounters and connections, a whole new world. That year changed my life. And as the end of the Athens school year approached and the question of what to do with my life loomed again, I found the courage to relinquish the student's hand-me-down desire to become a Tweedy professor and chose instead the uncharted path of becoming a writer. I had no idea where that path would lead. I just knew that I wanted to walk it, wild and wide-eyed, daring to dream. That's how I became a travel writer. That's the beginning of how I became a travel writer. Um, I got a master's degree in creative writing. Still didn't know what to do with my life. I won a two-year uh, fellowship from Princeton, a Princeton in Asia fellowship to go teach in Japan at a school called International Christian University, which had bilingual, lots of English language classes. That's where I met my wonderful wife, Kuniko, who's in the audience, <laughs> and who changed my life again. And I fell in love with Japan and uh, started to write some travel stories. Um, and when I came back at the end of that fellowship, I came back to the United States, decided to settle in San Francisco because I'd never th thought about living in San Francisco before, but it seemed like a congenial and cosmopolitan place. And I got here and through a very incredible series of serendipities that would require a, a couple of bottles of wine for me to really adequately tell you about. Um, I ended up getting a job as a travel writer for the San Francisco Examiner and uh, the Examiner and Chronicle. And I, I did that for a year, and that really changed my life. I never, never changed course after that. I became a travel writer. That was in 1980, and I've been a travel writer and editor ever since then. I was at the Examiner for Chronicle for 15 years. From there, I moved to a, a startup at that time called Salon.com. Do you all know Salon? Yeah, a startup. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was the wanderlust editor for Salon. I started the, the wanderlust travel site on Salon, and that was a really heady, wonderful, exhilarating time when you may be familiar with this notion, but we were writing the rules, basically. It was the Wild West of internet publishing, and we were one of the first people there, and we were making it up as we went along, and it was really, really fun. Um, I left, I left um, Salon after six years, and I went to work with my good friends, Tony and Maureen Wheeler, at Lonely Planet. Does anybody know Lonely Planet? <laughs> Amazing, wonderful guidebooks. Um, they asked me to become the global travel editor there. So I, I wrote a column for their website. I edited one literary uh, book a year. I helped oversee the, the editorial direction of Lonely Planet. and. Uh, for better or for worse, I was the public spokesperson for Lonely Planet. I was the face of Lonely Planet for about seven years. And uh, it was wonderful. It was a really magical ride with a great company that believes strongly in uh, the power of travel, the transformational power of travel, and, and why we all should get out and see the world and share ourselves with the world. So I was absolutely in tune with that message and loved that job. In 2007, I decided to spread my wings and try life as a freelancer. And I immediately uh, went to work both for Geographic Expeditions, editing their wonderful website and blog. And I brought some catalogs from Geographic Expeditions around the table there 
They're a really fantastic um, adventure travel company that travels all around the world and, and does it with great heart and great soul and great consciousness. Uh, they do a great job. So I'm very happy to be affiliated with them. And then I also went to work with Ge National Geographic Traveler as an editor at large. I write a column for their magazine and I write a column for their website. And I love being affiliated with National Geographic. It's one of the world's great institutions. Wherever I go, the farthest flung corner of the world, when I see someone and I say I write for National Geographic, they say, oh my god, I love National Geographic. We have a stack like that in our garage. <laughs> <clears throat> There's a lot of stacks of National Geographics all around the world, apparently. Um, so that's, uh, so I'm really honored and thrilled to work with those two organizations. And now I also work with BBC Travel, another fantastic global brand and organization. So I feel incredibly blessed. I've been able to write and travel, do the work that I love, see the world that I love, share me with the world. And um, it's just been a really incredibly special journey and it's still going. So, um, so I thought I would read just a couple of just a couple of pieces, short pieces from my book. The book was a long time coming. It probably, it was 40 years coming actually, but it took me still about five years of even intensely working on the book to put it together. I had about 700 articles to choose from and so there was a lot of reading to do and a lot of condensing to do. And I ended up choosing the articles that to my mind reproduce two journeys. There's always a journey into the outer world, but then in the best travel stories, I think there's a journey into the inner world at the same time. You talk about how a place is affecting you, and there's this kind of go back and forth. Um, so it's the record of two contemporaneous journeys, outside and inside, and the, the stories in this book try to do that. Some of the stories are very short, 750 words, um, the kind of column length that I've been writing all my life. The longest piece in the book is 9,000 words. The Cambodia story that Laura kindly mentioned is 7,000 words. So there's a long, there's quite a, a wide spectrum there from about 500 words to 9,000 words. I like to think that it's a great book to take on the road. Um, easy to read, easy to read in an airplane. There are quick chapters that go by easily, slide down easily, I hope. I'm just going to read a couple of those pieces. So the first one I'm going to read is called Ryoanji Reflections, and it's about the Ryoanji Rock Garden in Kyoto, Japan. Has anybody been there by any chance? OK, great, great. Um, and this was written for a magazine that I edited when I was at the Chronicle that was published four times a year called Great Escapes. And every issue of Great Escapes had a different theme. The theme of this one was Sacred Places. So I begin in this essay talking a little bit about other sacred places, and, and then I get to Rio Anji. <coughs> Excuse me. So this is Rio Anji Reflections. When I think of the sacred places I have encountered in my own travels, I recall the Temple of Poseidon on the cliff of Cape Sunian in Greece, where I spent a wild night huddled in my sleeping bag among the moonlit columns surrounded by tearing wind, the crashing of waves, and ghostly, godly dreams. I think, too, of Bali, of the lush, lovingly sculpted land and the gentle people, more profoundly imbued with a sense of sanctity, of life as a holy gift to be celebrated, than any other I have met. But most vividly of all, I think of a simple plot of sand and rocks and moss in Kyoto, the rock garden at Ryoanji Temple. The guidebooks will tell you that the rock garden was built in the 15th century, probably by a renowned Zen influence artist named Soami, and that it is considered a masterpiece of the kare sansui, dry landscape garden style. It consists of 15 irregularly shaped rocks of varying sizes, some surrounded by moss, arranged in a bed of white sand that is raked every day. A low earthen wall surrounds the garden on three sides overhung by a narrow beamed wooden roof. On the fourth side, wooden steps lead to a wide wooden platform and the main building of the temple itself. 
Beyond the wall are cedar, pine, and cherry trees. Such a description gives a sense of the history and look of the place. But to understand its power, its pure presence, you have to go there. The first time I visited Rio Anji, I was overwhelmed, first by the spareness of the site, and second by loudspeakers that every 15 minutes squawked out a recorded message about the history and spirit of the garden to the busloads of obedient school children and tourists who filed through. But something held me there. Morning passed to afternoon, and still I sat on the well-worn platform, staring. Kids in black caps, tiny book-filled backpacks, and black and white school uniforms passed by, studying me while I studied the garden. And adults in shiny cameras and kimonos clicked and clucked and walked on. Clouds came and went, and the branches beyond the garden bent, straightened again, bent again. I saw how the pebbly sand had been meticulously raked in circles around the rocks and in straight lines in the open areas, and how those lines stopped without a misplaced pebble when they touched the circular patterns and then resumed unchanged beyond them. I saw how pockets of moss had filled the pox in the stones and how the sand echoed the sky, the moss echoed the trees, the wall and roof balanced the platform, and the rocks seemed to emanate a web of intricate, tranquil tension within the whole. It was an exquisite enigma, telling me something I couldn't put words to, and so it has remained. I have seen Rio Anji in spring when the cherry trees bloomed, and in fall when their branches were bare. In winter when snow covered the moss, and in summer when the cicadas buzzed beyond the wall. I have been there among giggling teenagers and gaping farmers, bemused westerners and beatific monks. By now it has become a part of me, and still it eludes me. I love the place partly because it is so emphatically not a 10-minute tourist stop. Its dimensions defy the camera. I've never seen a true picture of the place. And its subtle simplicity defies quick assimilation. It makes you sit and study, slow down and stare until you really see it in its particularity and in its whole simultaneously. And yet, and here the enigma expands, you cannot see all of Rio Anji at one time. The rocks are so arranged that you can see only 14 of the stones wherever you stand. You have to visualize, imagine the final one. How wonderful. It is in this sense that Rio Anji is for me the essential sacred place. It is complete in itself, but for you to completely perceive it, you have to transcend the boundary between inner and outer, to travel inward as well as outward, to find and finish it in your mind. And the gigglers, the camera clickers, and the squawking loudspeakers are all in their exasperating reality part of this completion. Beyond a great irony of modern Japan, loudspeakers instructing you to appreciate the silence, they embody a much larger meaning. You must embrace them all, the monks and the moss and the trees, the school kids and the stones, to really be there, to be whole. Thanks. That's Rio Anji. So I hope that transported you for a moment to Japan. Uh, I'm going to read one other story, one other little essay, and then I'll just ask you to, to tell me your questions, and we'll, and we'll talk. But I wanted to share this one. It's about Stinson Beach. Do you all know Stinson Beach? It's a special place. 
And it's a place I go back to all the time, as you'll hear in this. So this is called A Pilgrim at Stinson Beach. July 20th, 2011, 11.30 AM. I'm sitting at the southern tip of Stinson Beach, a glorious mile-long stretch of sand that borders the unincorporated population 650 hamlet of the same name in Marin County, Northern California. Stinson Beach is a ragged flip-flops, bikinis, and board shorts kind of town. And whether you're a Bay Area visitor or resident, it's a terrific place to stop. A couple of inviting restaurants face each other across the Seoul Street, famed Highway 1, that runs through town. Both have sun umbrellaed patios that are intimations of heaven on a balmy blue sky day like today. There are arts and crafts galleries, a quintessential little bit of everything market, B&Bs, and a beguiling bookstore with a compact ecumenical and eminently Marin mix of books ranging from Zen treatises and Native American history and culture to mainstream mysteries and fiction and a proud selection of work by local authors. I love these riches, but they're not why I come here. Stinson Beach is about an hour's winding drive from my house, so it's not exactly an on a whim destination for me. Rather, it's a touchstone place where I come to gather myself. And today, I need gathering. So here I am, ensconced on a rock beyond an outcrop of massive boulders that separates this thin slice of sand from the main beach, where a couple hundred people are blissfully surfing, strolling, and sunbathing. I've been in this spot for 20 minutes, and I haven't seen anyone except a teenage couple who appeared holding hands Literally, just as I wrote, I haven't seen anyone, and jumped when they saw me, and now have abruptly turned back. <laughs> and I like it that way. In the 1980s and 90s, when I was the travel editor at the San Francisco newspaper, I used to make a pilgrimage here every spring to write a column. This was the place where I gathered my thoughts, looked back on the triumphs and failures of the year past, and ahead to the New Year's goals and dreams. It's still a good place to take stock of things. The simplicity of the scene strips away the veneers of life, reduces the distracting complexities. Sea, rocks, sand, sun, that's it. The spareness helps me, makes me, slow down and pay attention. The roar and swash of the waves echo in my ears. The salty sea smell fills my nose. The sun warms like a hot compress on my shoulders. My toes wiggle into the wet, cool sand. The water white froths in, spreads into rippling fans over the sand, then rushes back again and again. A seagull web walks through the waves, leaps onto a rock, scans the water for food, it prances with oddly brittle legs along the sand, flaps to the top of a rock, and imperiously surveys the waves. A slick six-foot seaweed pod washes onto the beach. A tiny insect scurries over my keyboard. A neon green bug lands briefly on my screen. I let the sea wash over me, let the waves fill my head and lungs, lose myself to this inconceivably old and ageless place. I think, this is the same scene I witnessed two decades ago, quite possibly the same rock I sat on then, scribbling in my journal as I tap into my laptop now. And if I come back in 20 years, it will almost certainly be the same still. But of course, much has changed in those two decades. My children have grown up and moved on. My dad and other loved ones have passed away. New jobs, new places, new books, old dreams. And suddenly these words flow into my brain. Where does it all come together? What does it mean? The sea swashing ceaselessly scrubs the mind clean. 
I palm the rough sandy surface of the boulder to my left, warmed by the sun, cradling sand in its pocks and green ridges of moss in its cracks, etched by wind, wave, and rain. Wisps like smoke from a seaborne fire drift around me, and on the horizon a bank of gray-blue fog gathers, curling at the top so that it looks like a frozen tidal wave. I think of the tsunami in Sendai, where my daughter traveled recently and saw the destruction with her own eyes, where the local man who was guiding her broke down and cried. All those uprooted lives. Where does it come together? What does it mean? The waves push glinting pebbles onto the shore, fan, recede. The seagull flaps away, unsatisfied, searching. Life is precarious, uncertain, brief. There is a precious precariousness at the heart of all things. The sea swashing ceaselessly scrubs the mind clean. The waves roar, splash in, getting a little closer now. The tide is coming in. The blue pebble we inhabit is turning in the celestial sea. Where does it come together? What does it mean? Focus. Enjoy the moment while you have it. Enjoy your loved ones while you have them. Recognize the gifts the world gives you. Inhale the sea. Sink your toes into the sand. Let the ocean roar silence your mind. Then take this simple scene home with you. Sun, sand, rocks, sea. The sea swashing ceaselessly scrubs the mind clean. What it all comes down to, I think, is the relationships you forge, the experiences you embrace, the lessons you bestow, the ideals you seed, the love you live and leave. Dedicate yourself to creating something of value with your days, something that will last. The sea swashing ceaselessly scrubs the mind clean. Where does it come together? What does it mean? Sun, sand, rocks, sea, a Stinson beach, clarity. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. That's very kind. Thank you very, very much. Um, so I'd love to open the floor to your questions. Whatever, how to become a travel writer, the best place to go in the world. So how, how do you balance the actual writing process with the traveling? Like, do you write while you're traveling? How do you stay in the moment there and then come up with these great pieces at the end? Yeah, thank you. So it's an ongoing process. Um, I take copious notes on the road. I have a little uh, notebook that I carry with me all the time that well, actually I have it right here. I literally carry it with me all the time. Um, it's this wonderful notebook. And in case I forget what it is, it helpfully says notebook on the cover. So, <laughs> so that's, a good, that's good. Um, I got this in Japan when I lived there, and I've, I've loved them and carried them ever since. This is number 14 that I'm on. So I carry these with me, and I always try to make time to sit somewhere for an hour and write about what's happening around me. And then I also take notes um, you know, frequently on the road. I'll just jot down little quick notes. Um, you know, Blue poppies, gray field, something like that, uh, just to remind me where I've been. And I use my phone a lot. I'll talk into my phone to, to record my impressions of a place. And I use my camera a lot, well, my phone. I use my phone a lot, again, as my camera to, uh, to take photos. So, the limited storage capacity of my brain doesn't have to remember what things look like. I can do that with a photo. So I'm constantly doing that on the road. And, and I, the other thing that I'm doing on the road constantly is trying to figure out what the story is. I'm in a place and I'm thinking, what am I going to write about? What am I going to write about? What am I going to write about? And that voice becomes annoying but essential. And uh, I try my best to embrace the place and give myself to it as fully as possible and at the same time to figure out what the essence of the place is. What's the story for me? What's the connection? What's the kind of passion point between me and the place that might develop into a bigger story? And I just do that over and over and over again. I've been doing it for 40 years now, and one of these decades I'm going to get it down. And um, 
that turns out to be a very fruitful coalescence that I then can bring back home and, and write the story more in contemplative reflection at home. I really do the writing writing, but I have a lot of massive body of notes to deal with uh, to help me with that. Um, you've been to so many places, and I wonder where are you going next, and how do you select those places? Uh, great question. I'm, well, I'm literally going next to Japan, <laughs> <laughs> which is not new to me, but it's always new anyway. Um, I'm actually going there on March 26th with Kuniko, and uh, we're going to go to Kyoto and then to the island of Shikoku, where Kuniko is from. And I, it's partly pleasure and partly work for me. I actually lead a, a small tour group for geographic expeditions, a group of eight people. So we're going to go to Kyoto and Shikoku. I try to show them the wonders of Japan through my eyes. And they end up showing me the wonders of Japan through their eyes, which is really nice. And uh, so that's my next trip. Um, how I decide where to go is part, it's, it's a mixture of the outside world coming to me and me going to the outside world. A, a good example is I was invited to go to the Melbourne Writers' Festival. Uh, and I went there. And then the Singapore Writers' Festival invited me to go there. So I went to Singapore, where I knew I was going to go to Singapore. And I realized that Singapore was very close to Cambodia. And I'd always wanted to go to Angkor Wat ever since I'd been a child. And I think I'd seen a photo of Angkor Wat in National Geographic, probably, one of those stacks in the, in the garage. And um, I realized I could do that from Singapore. It was a quick flight. So I made my quick flight. I, I did that myself. And I ended up writing about it for the BBC travel um, a column that I edit. So Melbourne and Singapore were invitations from the outside world that enticed me to go there. And I ended up some, writing some things about that as well. And then the trip I really wanted to make was the one to Cambodia, which I just put together myself because it was so close. And I figured something magical would happen in Cambodia. And it definitely, definitely did. And it was not what I expected at all. Um, and, and you can read about it in the book. It's the last story in the book, is my trip to Cambodia and how incredibly overwhelmed I was and, and, and moved beyond expression almost by my encounters with the people there. And I got out into the, the jungle. And there was a temple in the jungle. And I had my little Indiana Jones moment. And um, it was really, really a, a moving, profoundly life-changing trip. So that's, it's that kind of a balance of the world coming to me and me going out to the world, I think. Did that answer the question? <laughs> Thank you. I was wondering, how do you? How can you disconnect yourself, or, or I guess um, connect to the places you travel when there's so much technology around you? Because when I travel, it's so hard for me to stay away from your phone. I, I try to keep right. away from it, but I'm always checking it for maybe translations or right. directions. And then I check email, and it's just <laughs> a disaster every single time I try to just let myself <laughs> go and, and enjoy right. the moment. <clears throat> yes. You, should, you must work for a tech company or something. <laughs> <clears throat> um, yeah, it's a huge distraction. It's really an incredibly huge distraction. And so I make a very, very conscious effort. Um, it's the equivalent of when I was the spokesperson for Lonely Planet, one of the things I always would say is that we at Lonely Planet who publish guidebooks would like you to leave your guidebook behind at least one day of your journey and go out and get lost. Because that's going to show you a different place. When we're happy that with our guidebooks we can help you understand a place better, but you will understand it in a different way if you leave your guidebook in your hotel room and go out and get lost. So please do that. And um, I feel the same way about all the wonderful technology that we have at our fingertips. I, would, I leave that in my hotel room at least once, one day. And I just wander out and get lost and immerse myself in the place. And I tell myself that I'm on assignment. And that sort of liberates me from having to update my Facebook or you know, answer email or tweet. I mean, I'm, I say, you know you're here. Be here. Every time you post on Facebook is a bit of a, it takes you away for a second from being here. And so I, I try to have um, moments, you know, protracted moments of time when I'm without any technology in my life at all, except maybe my camera and my phone as my camera. And so I, I immerse myself in the place. And for me, that kind of immersive travel is really hugely important. Part of the wonder of um, my Cambodia trip was I spent a, a homestay in a place called Bante Chamara where there was no Wi-Fi. So my, when I first got there, I said, and, and how's the Wi-Fi here? And my host said, there is no Wi-Fi here. 
And I was like, oh. <laughs> and I went, oh my god, what am I going to do? And then I thought, that's wonderful. I have three days without Wi-Fi. I can just kind of really be here. And it was. It was a great gift. And so I think you have to give yourself that gift. And it is a gift. You know, you, you, you get more out of the place, I think, when you're not constantly thinking, how could I tweet about this? Or how could I Facebook about this? Or how could I send an email about this? Sometimes it's good to just be there. Be there, be there, be there. And I really strongly recommend that. Because the technology is there, and you'll always have it. But you'll only be in Cambodia for a few days or a few precious moments. So make, make the most of it. Did that make sense as an answer? <laughs> so on your next trip, I want you to do that and send me an email and let me know how it went. <laughs> what advice would you give for getting published for someone just starting out? There seems to be an overload of information on where to send things, who to. Yeah, there is an overload of information. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't mention my book, Lonely Planet's Guide to Travel Writing. Um, it's a book about how to be a travel writer, so it has a lot of information. I hope good information about how to get published. But I think, um, as you know, there's, there's the self-publishing route. You can have a blog. You can have your own website. You can publish yourself that way. And that's great and fine. And you can grow a, a presence and a platform and reach people that way. The more traditional, conventional route is getting published in newspapers and magazines and websites. And I think the way. The secret to doing that is to target one or two th or three places that you really, really want to appear in and just get to know them intimately. So that what I say in my book is you should become the editor of the place that you want to get published. In your head, you should understand exactly why each story is there, what its role in the picture puzzle. That Every editor has a picture puzzle of their publication in their brain. And if you can figure out what that puzzle looks like and why that story's there and why that story's there and why that story's there, then you can come up with a story that fits that picture puzzle. And then you can write a query letter to the editor saying, I have this great story about Portugal that I want to do, and it's about a homestay. And I've noticed that you enjoy publishing stories on homestays, and I think this would fit perfectly with your editorial mission. And, and that's the way to, to do it, basically. Become the editor of the publication you want to get into, figure out how your story fits into that picture puzzle, and then send it off. The other way that I should say, too, is if you want to write for magazines, the tried and true route is to write <clears throat> little tiny 200-word pieces that are in the front of the magazine. That's what most people do. Yeah. You know, The hot new hotel just opened in San Francisco, and you do four or five or six of those, and you develop a rapport with an editor. And then the editor says, why don't you send me a pitch for a larger story? And we'd, we'd like to move you into the middle of the magazine now. So that's another great way. And I know a number of writers who've started out that way, writing those 250-word little stories. And they develop that relationship. And then suddenly, they're in the middle of the magazine writing long stories. So Thank you. I, I hope it works. My question is, as we've seen a lot of political and economic shifts in the world over the last few decades, and you being a travel writer, having been doing this for 40 years or so, um, how have you um, have those shifts affected the way you observe a place when you go there or your writings in any way? Yes, that's a big question. It's a great question. Um, definitely, all those shifts really affect me as a, as a human being, as a traveler. I mean, some places that I went 40 years ago you can't go to now. Other places that you couldn't go 40 years ago you can go to now. Um, I find myself in a place like Dubrovnik. When I was in Dubrovnik, the, the siege of Dubrovnik had just happened a couple of years earlier. And so <clears throat> you could literally see the, the, the damage done by the bombs all around you. And I remember walking along the walls that go around Dubrovnik and looking at a stretch of roof, rooftops, roof tiles. And there were fractured, scattered roof tiles. And then right next to them, there were the new roof tiles. And that seemed like such a poignant metaphor for me of what had happened there, both the destruction and the rebuilding. And I realized that I, as a tourist, putting dollars into that, or putting money into that economy, was part of that new roof tile. I was part of the reconstruction of the place. And I think that that's a huge part of travel for me, is what we do to the places we go to. We can do bad, or we can do great. And, and as a traveler going to a place that's just come out of a period of divisive war, you do great. And I was 
happy in, in Dubrovnik that I, I could be a part of that process. And again, in Mostar, when I was there, you could see the traces of bullet holes in all the buildings. I went to the cemetery, and the cemetery, were, there were all these fresh plots, people who died in the recent war. And I just thought, thank God that I'm here now, that I can bear witness to the rebirth of this place, that I can help that rebirth, and that I can tell the world about. It's safe to come here now. Please come. Bring your money with you. Help build this wonderful, beautiful cultural center back into the, the great place it used to be. So that world is constantly changing. There's always challenges. There's places you can't go and places you can go. And I find that my message always is affected by whatever's happened in the place where I've just been. And Cambodia was an amazing example. This terrible, tragic civil war that they had with Pol Pot. And to see the, the hope and resilience, to see the hope in the children's eyes was incredibly moving to me. They had these bright, piercing, wonderfully bright eyes. And I just thought, there's the future right there. And how extraordinary it is, one, that the Adults around me survived what they survived and lived to tell. But how wonderful that the children, the next generation, are full of hope and enthusiasm and energy, and they're going to make the world a better place, not just their country a better place. They'll make the world a better place. And so it's this wonderful, my whole life has been this wonderful kind of interchange between the world and me and what's going on politically and economically. And travel makes such a huge, profound difference in that and really, really helps make the world a better place. And I think that as travelers, we connect with people, we meet people, we understand that there is no other. You know, Before we go somewhere, it's an other. And then we go there, and there is no other. They're like us. We're all the same. We're all in this big boat together. And I think that travel, more than anything else, probably paves the road for, for peace and understanding and connection among people. And that's, that's why I be, I've become a travel evangelist, I feel like. I, this is my pulpit, and I talk about, you know, get out there and travel, because it changes the world for the better. You become an agent of great change. So um, that was a very long-winded answer to your question, but I hope that made sense. Yeah, thank you. When you live in California, it seems that everything is recycled, organic, and every other person is either <laughs> starting a charity or supporting one <laughs> passionately. So. Right. But then you open up the news or a newspaper and you read about how much we're consuming and how bad everything is yeah. and everything is destro being destroyed, basically. So with your years of experience, have you noticed any kind of patterns or if, like, uh, w what, do you, what do you see when you're out there, basically? Yeah. That's a great question. I think that um, the world is step by, I mean, evolution, I think, is working it's very, 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 very slowly. But uh, the world is much more conscious ecologically now than it was 40 years ago when I started out. Um, still, you know, there's such a long way to go. But recycling has taken root in places where there was no recycling 40 years ago. The whole notion, for example, of not using plastic bottles has started to catch on more and more. There's still such a long way to go. but. People have stopped, or people are more aware of not using plastic as being a good thing. Um, environmental stewardship, not um, just leaving your trash behind when you go out on a mountain trail, but making sure that you pack out everything that you packed in. Those kinds of principles and practices are definitely spreading. And it's remarkably slow, but it's still spreading in the right direction. So I'm thrilled about that. On the other hand, there are things that are really sobering. Like we were talking earlier about Mount Kilimanjaro. I climbed Kilimanjaro in 1976. And there was still a lot of snow. There was a really substantial amount of snow up there. In recent photographs that I've seen, there's very little snow left there. And that's sobering, scary. It's, uh, you know, we're unleashing forces of which we know nothing about, basically, I think. And so that gives me a certain amount of despair. But I counter that despair by doing everything that I can to make the world a better place and encouraging the people I come into contact with to do the same thing and to be environmentally conscious and do the right thing by the, by the planet and by the environment. And I do think that message is definitely spreading. And it, it's easy to get despair, despairing, but um, I feel hopeful. And in 40 years, I feel that the planet's on the right track. Things are getting better and better in a lot of places. People are more and more enlightened and more and more aware of the effect that they have on the world around them. And while there's an extraordinarily long way to go, at least we're in the right direction, I think. Thank you so much for coming today and sharing you. your wonderful stories. 
I, the first thing I want to say is I would argue that you did become a poet through uh. your stories. <laughs> They're wonderful. Thank you. Um, secondly, I'd like to know, would you consider returning to Google and perhaps doing a brown bag or workshop with us and share some of the awarenesses and yep. uh, yes. knowledge you've gained over your trips? Thank you. I'm honored. If, if Google would like me to come back, I would love to come back. I would totally love to come back. We would love it. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Wow. That's wonderful. That's the best question yet. <laughs> wow, thank you. Well, I just want to take a moment to say thank you so very, very much for being here and for listening so wonderfully attentively and for allowing me to share my stories with you. And if I can come back and share some more, I really would love to. But this has been a great blessing for me. So thank you very, very much. Appreciate it.